Good afternoon and good evening. If you're joining us for studying the dynamic sensations of eating, we'll be starting in just about a minute or so. Thank you for your patience. Okay, we are going to get started. We have enough people. So good afternoon and good evening to anyone joining us today. My name is Alan Dominguez and on behalf of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled Studying the Dynamic Sensations of Eating presented by Lisa Dizer. Uh, we, we would like to thank you, the listeners, for being here and spending the next hour with us. We also would like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow the work of IDDSI to continue. So before we begin, I just wanna go to some quick housekeeping. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website by the end of this week. Uh, second, everyone attending this webinar, uh, you're joining us today on a listen-only mode, which means that the panelists, uh, the panelists today won't be able to hear or see you and your microphone and your video will remain off for the session. Now, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, you can submit them uh, throughout the webinar. And to do so, you, have, you can use the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom of your screen, typically. Uh, you can click on that and submit your question. And Lisa will address the questions at the end of her presentation, uh, at the end of her presentation when we'll have 10 to 15 minutes to answer uh, the Q&A period. Now, in the upcoming days, a certificate of attendance will, will be emailed to anyone attending the session via a computer. So if you're joining us through a phone line, uh, please make sure to email us at meetings at iddsi.org within the next couple of days and let us know who you are so we can email you a certificate of attendance. We currently do not offer a CEUs, unfortunately, but uh, we're happy to provide that certificate of attendance. Um, perfect, that is all for housekeeping. So moving on to our presenter for this session. Uh, Lisa Dicer is an associate professor in the Department of Food Science at the University of Guelph, Canada. She's conducted sensory research for the past 25 years in both Canada and New Zealand. And the overall aim of her research program is to ensure that older adults have access to foods that are optimum in terms of nutrition and taste. In her lab, she conducts fundamental research to examine the contribution of oral processing to sensory perception of textures of semi-solid foods. Ooh, that's, that's a mouthful. <laughs> she is also affiliated with the Agri-Food and Healthy Aging Research Group, where she collaborates on projects exam examining food-first approaches to improving nutrient intake in older adults. Uh, so welcome, Lisa, and thank you so much for uh, the, your presentation today. Um, so without further ado, I will hand it over to you to get your presentation started. So welcome and go ahead. Thank you, Alan. And, and thank you to everyone for being here, whether it's very early in the morning or late at night or somewhere in between. This is a talk that I uh, presented at the Dysphagia Research Society Conference earlier this year in March. And um, I was asked to present it again to a larger audience through this webinar. So this is an area that I'm quite passionate about and have spent many years of my academic life studying and, and I'm really pleased to be able to share it with you today. What I'm going to present to you today are basically three broad topics. First, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about oral processing and texture perception. And then I'm going to move on to talk to you about the different types of sensory evaluation techniques that we can use to characterize perceptions, particularly as they relate to texture and particularly as it relates to the work we've been doing in pureed foods. And then lastly, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about some research we've recently completed where we're trying to understand the role of saliva in perception of, of thickness of pureed foods. So just to begin the presentation, I want you all to think about what you do when you eat. Some of you may have food that you're eating right now, or some of you may just be looking at the picture of the apple that's sitting on the screen in front of you. 
what we do when we bite into this food is we break the product down. And so those structural changes are um, providing an opportunity for us to start perceiving different textures in the food products. And at the same time, as we bite into that food and we start chewing and breaking the structure down further, we're going to see compounds being released. And those compounds could be in the form of volatiles, meaning that it's going to help us perceive flavors in the food, or it could be compounds that are not volatile and are actually contributing to the taste of the food. But throughout the time course of us eating and chewing and swallowing, what we end up doing is integrating all of these sensations and perceptions, and then that gives us our, our indication of the textures, the flavors, and the tastes of the food. Another way to think about this is to actually put it into a model. And this is uh, called the in-mouth process model, which has been around for quite a number of years now. If you watch the blue uh, food blob, you'll see what happens with this in-mouth food or in this in-mouth process model, where when we bite the food and we start chewing the food, we see that the structure breaks down and this is occurring over time and saliva is being introduced as we're chewing and eventually we get to the point where we're going to have a swallowable bolus and what i like doing in the sensory world is understanding all of the sensory properties that are occurring throughout that entire breakdown of the food product and so there are many from a texture perspective that we can perceive and these are just some examples these are by no means everything that we could be perceiving as we're chewing a food because it's very dependent on the food it's also very dependent on the, the original structure of the food but we can divide it quite broadly into different categories of early chew down middle chew down late and then residual or what happens after we swallow and the products, the attributes that we're perceiving can be categorized into different categories depending on the type of action that's occurring. So in the early chew down phase, what we're seeing happening are properties that we describe as mechanical properties. And these are properties of the foods that are occurring because of an application of a force. So where our jaw is helping us to break that food down and then we're perceiving attributes like hardness, or perhaps fracturability, and the opposite of that would be crumbliness, or how the product deforms or essentially how it springs back as a force is being applied to it. As we move into middle and late chew down, what we see happening are, are the presence of other types of mechanical properties in the form of adhesiveness or how it sticks to you, or um, cohesiveness in the late chew down, which is how it sticks to itself. We also see moisture being released throughout the middle and late chewdown periods, as well as some geometrical properties occurring. And these are related to the particles that are developing as the structures are being broken down. And this could be words like graininess or powderiness or grittiness or sandiness, things that are helping us uh, perceive the, the feel of the food in our mouth. And we also start thinking about how that food is being broken down. When we swallow, we still have some sensory attributes that are being perceived, and, and you'll see this throughout my talk, that mouth coating actually is quite prevalent in a lot of the modified texture carrots that we study, and we also might see some throat coating, which is essentially how that product is coating the throat after it's been swallowed. Now we want to try and figure out how we can characterize these properties and so in the sensory world there are a number of different techniques that we can do for this and I've categorized them here as static measurements or temporal measurements. Static measurements are, are the measurements that we would use if we wanted to conduct what we call a descriptive analysis on our food product. A descriptive analysis is where we train a small group of individuals, somewhere between 10 and 12, and we ask them to characterize the intensities of attributes that they're perceiving in the food product. And this could be in the form of textures or flavors, or we could be conducting what's called a quantitative descriptive analysis where we're looking at all of the attributes that are present within the food product. When we conduct our static measurements, we have to work quite hard with this panel to get them to understand the attributes and the definitions that they are going to be using when they characterize the food products. And so we spend a great deal of time um, just getting them to understand how to put the product in their mouth, how to chew it, how to evaluate it, so that we can get a, a good reproducible understanding of all of the characteristics in the product. 
We could also take a look at temporal measurement, which is essentially where we're trying to understand how the properties are changing during oral processing from the time the product is first put in the mouth and the, until the time it's swallowed. And we have two categories that I have um, indicated here. The first is what I'm calling intensity measurements, where we're actually looking at how strong N attribute or multiple attributes are throughout the time course of chewing. How does it appear and how does it disappear? We also see more recently techniques that I'm labeling nominal techniques. And these are techniques where we're not interested in intensity. We just want to know if, if the attribute is present in the food product and at what point during chewing that attribute is present. And the two techniques that I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to you about are temporal dominance of sensations or TDS. If you hear me refer to TDS, that's temporal dominance of sensations. And, and the second technique called temporal check all that apply or or TCADA. So I would like to start by just talking to you briefly about a static measurement because it forms the basis of um, some of the temporal measurements that, that um, I'm going to talk about later in my presentation. The, the descriptive analysis technique that we have been using to characterize purees has been quite useful for us to understand how different sensory properties in, in our purees are, are different. And so some really early work that we conducted in this area was to take commercial modified texture carrots and evaluate them according to a number of different attributes. And that's what you see on this screen is a list of all of the attributes we were measuring. And so they included color, aroma, um, thickness, and then some different flavors and tastes that we knew were present within all of the commercial products that we were testing. And so we worked with our panel to come up with the different definitions that you see on this screen, and also the anchors that they were using on the scales to do their evaluation. We use a 15 centimeter line scale to make this evaluation where the low part of the scale is weak or um, not strong in a characteristic, and the upper part of the scale is strong or intense. And when we have used this technique to characterize our commercial purees, this is the resulting graph from our data analysis. This is a spider plot. And the way you look at this graph is the closer to the origin or the zero point in the middle of the graph is weak and the further out you get is strong. And each spoke of this graph shows you one of the attributes that the panel was evaluating. And C1 to C4 are the products because they were commercial products for confidentiality reasons, I'm not indicating what they are, but you can see by looking at this graph that they are a, a wee bit different where C1 is perceived by the panel to be thicker and a little more green in its flavor and also a little um, and quite a bit lower in color intensity. The other three products, C2 through to C4, are more similar in terms of the sensory properties of the product. So what this allows us to do is get a snapshot of what's, what's present in the food product and how intense those particular characteristics are, but it doesn't actually give us any indication of how any of these attributes are appearing or disappearing as the products are being orally processed. And for that, we have to move into our temporal sensory measurements. So the first temporal sensory method I'm going to talk about is time intensity. This is the oldest technique that it has been around for quite a long period of time. It was developed to measure bitterness in beer and it has been used for a number of different sensory properties in a number of different food products since then. And essentially what the panelists see is a line very similar to the, the black line you see on the left hand side of your screen that's labeled with anchors of low and high and the panelist is asked to indicate the cursor up and down the line indicating how intense the particular attribute is that they're they're evaluating and in the example i have here it's an indication of the tenderness of the sample my master's research was to use time intensity to evaluate tenderness of, of beef and it was the first time textures had been evaluated using time intensity and so that's why tenderness is what's sitting on this screen the result of our, our time intensity data collection is, is the graph that you see on the, on the right hand side of the screen, which is what we call a time intensity curve. 
And that time intensity curve has many parameters. It's, um, it's a curve that is showing the intensity as it occurs over time. And you can see from that graph the number of different parameters that we can, we can look at. So we have an indication of the maximum intensity of the particular attribute we're looking at. We have an indication of the duration of the, intense, uh, of the attribute that we're looking at. But we also have some interesting other parameters we can look at, such as the increase angle, which is an indication of how long it takes for the, or how rapid it, the, the attribute is in its onset and how rapid it is in its, its decline. And then we have an overall measure of area under the curve, which just is an overall measure of, of the attribute that we are looking at. We have used this technique not for measuring modified texture foods, but in experiments where we're trying to understand tastes as they um, are occurring in model solutions of phenolic acids and what happens upon repeated consumption of these phenolic acids because we know that phenolic acids are not contributing positive sensory attributes in food products. And so in the example you see here, what we asked our panelists to do was to drink four sips of each solution, which is the four blips that you see on our graph, and how the intensity builds over consumption of, of, the, of the beverages. And so you can see that for some of these phenolic acids, there's, there's a more significant increase in, in this case, bitterness than in other phenolic acids where the increase is quite slight. And time intensity is one of the only ways that we are able to collect that type of information. And it's useful for understanding how attributes are building and declining over time. One of the challenges we have in time intensity is that curves are all very individual. And so every panelist that does a time intensity panel has what is typically a representative curve for them. And I've, I'm showing you four curves here where you see for some people the um, attribute intensity increases relatively gradually and decreases also relatively gradually, or perhaps there's a rapid increase in intensity followed by a very gradual decrease or the opposite in the case of the participant in the, in the bottom quadrant. But what we know is that these are unique and reproducible. And, and these differences are because of differences in individual's anatomy differences due to how they've orally, orally manipulated the product, and also differences to how the panelists use the scale. And this makes time intensity challenging, but it also makes it quite interesting because it's capturing some of that individuality that occurs across people. Now, as I said, more recently, we've started to move into other types of, of temporal measurements for understanding attributes. And the reason for it is because with time intensity, we're only measuring one attribute at a time. Possibly we could measure two with dual attribute time intensity, but it's really quite limited in the number of attributes we can, can measure in one go. And so it doesn't give us an indication of how these attributes are interacting with each other. And so for that, we move into the nominal types of temporal um, sensory tests. And as I said, we have TDS and we have TCATA. You can see from the description of these two techniques, which are on the right hand side, what the panelists are being asked is somewhat similar, but also subtly different. And so in the case of temporal dominance of sensations, the panelists are given a list of words and they're asked to select one sensory property that is perceived to be as dominant or front of mind as they eat the sample. In the case of temporal check all that apply, it's not the dominant sensory attribute, it's whatever sensory properties, so it's plural, that they're perceiving as they eat the product. And so the panelists select and deselect the properties as they're going through the test. In our lab, we have spent some time looking at how different the results are that are collected from temporal dominance of sensations and TCATA. And for our modified texture carrots that we've been working with, they're not extremely different. And so I'm really only going to focus on TDS for the remainder of, of this part of the presentation. And so when we take a look at TDS, panelists are going to see what's at the top of the screen, a start and a stop button, and then a list of words that they are going to be asked to select from. When they put the product in their mouth and they click start, you'll see on the bottom, over time, this panelist has selected grainy as being present, 
and then it's going to move to thick and then throughout the entire oral process different attributes appear this is a bit extreme we don't tend to see this many these many attributes being selected for one particular food product but it just shows you that there could be if it was a very complex product that was being evaluated once we finish the test, we then analyze the data and we get what's called a, a TDS product curve. And this is a plot of the dominance rate, which is a count of the number of times an attribute was selected as dominant by participants. And it's plotted against time. And in this case, it's standardized time because we know that everybody is quite variable in the times that they are using to complete the test. So we standardize that to make it easier to look at the data. And what you see here is a plot of three attributes that are dominant throughout the time course of oral processing. And we know that because of the significance level that we determine anything above this line is considered to be significant. Anything below this line is considered to be just by chance. And so we also calculate a chance level so that we know that any of the attributes sitting below that line are actually probably just selected by one person or two people and are not dominantly perceived by everybody. And so we know here, I don't have these labeled, but you'll see later what these attributes are, that the purple line is appearing early in oral processing, and then we see the yellow line starting to appear, and then at the end we see green. And so we know those three attributes are the dominant attributes. And we have been applying this technique to understand what happens in modified textured carrots. And we have been using two hydrocolloids, xanthan gum and starch. We know that these are commonly used in long-term care homes to thicken liquids. And we were investigating what they do in, in modified texture carrots. And we were looking at these two hydrocolloids individually. So when they were just present in the modified texture carrot on their own, or when they were pre present in, in combination, so a starch and a xanthan blend. We also had a control, which was basically a modified texture carrot that had nothing added to it so that we could use it as a basis of comparison. What I have here is a picture of what the products look like. These products met IDSI for, for pureed foods. You can see on the left-hand side, we have the carrot puree with added xanthan, and it looks a bit shiny, it looks smooth, and in some cases, maybe a little bit slippery. Some people might think that. On the right-hand side, we see the carrot puree with cornstarch, which looks more granular and a little bit um, less shiny and more bumpy. Our control also looked like the cornstarch, the only difference being that the control also showed cineresis, which is moisture leakage from the food product because there was nothing holding that moisture into the product. And, but it had a very similar grainy look as the corn, to the cornstarch. When we take a look at the results we have um, observed from the TDS test, I'm, I'm not showing you all of the samples that we collected data from. I'm just showing you the ones that are interesting to me anyway. This is the control, the added cornstarch at its highest level and the added xanthan at its highest level. And what you can see here, the graph on the top, which is the control, is essentially the one that I showed you earlier. So the purple line is grainy. So the, the carrot puree control starts out as a grainy perception, followed by a thick perception, followed at the end by mouth coating, and this is the point of swallow. You can see that the cornstarch product does something similar to the control in terms of thick, grainy, and mouth coating just a, a little bit of a difference in the order of appearance of, of thick and grainy, and that the carrot puree with the added xanthan does something quite different. So it's perceived as smooth, it moves into adhesive, and at the end, it's mouth coating and slippery. And so I think that the images that you saw reflect that. You can tell that by looking at the sample, and you can see that that's what the panelists were considering to be dominant within that particular product. We can also plot this data a different way, and we can plot it by attribute so that we can take a look at how the samples um, are displaying each of the attributes. And so what I have here are four attributes, grainy, thick, slippery, and mouth coating. And you can see that the control, the starch, and the low xanthan all had an indication of graininess about them. None of the other samples had dominant graininess occurring. 
All of the samples showed a level of thickness. All of the samples showed a level of mouth coating at the very end. And then for slipperiness, it's not the, it's not the cornstarch alone, it's the cornstarch xanthan blends and one of the xanthans that is perceived as slippery. And so that then gives you an indication that xanthan is behaving differently to cornstarch in these particular food products. The nice thing about TDS is what we can do is we can take that data and we can plot it in what we call a sensory trajectory. And so you can see on this graph what this plot looks like. And so you start here at begin oral processing and you follow the lines along um, through to the very end where the numbers are sitting and that's the end of oral processing. And so at the beginning of oral processing, the control and starch samples are all perceived to be grainy and then there's mouth coating at the end of, of that uh, trajectory. The xanthan and starch xanthan blends do something quite different where they're, they've got uh, denseness, cohesiveness, adhesiveness, thinness down to mouth coating. And so TDS is a really nice technique to try and tease out what's actually happening as food is being orally processed. So to just conclude this section, we can see that dynamic methods are useful for tracking differences among products and that different hydrocolloids do affect texture differently, where we have some grainy perception occurring in the starch and xanthan is um, slippery and um, not nearly as, well, not grainy at all in comparison to the starch. But the question we have is all of this testing was done with a population of individuals that were young university age students. And so we would like to know how individuals with dysphagia perceive these products. But we realize that that could be quite challenging to investigate because we know that individuals with dysphagia can sometimes not articulate very well. And then so the question becomes, is it even important that we understand how they perceive this product or should we be actually asking liking? And can we measure dynamics of liking as that product is being orally processed? And the answer is yes, there are researchers that are doing this. Um, quite recently, there was a publication put out in a journal where they developed a technique called simultaneous temporal drivers of liking, where panelists were asked to complete the TDS task. And then on top of that, they were asked to indicate their liking and changes in liking as it occurred during oral processing. And so this probably is not for the faint of heart because it can sometimes be challenging to get people to uh, work through the TDS exercise and, and pairing a, a liking scale on top of that may not be for everybody, but it could be something that might be possible. With the population of individuals that I have previously worked with, I would say that wouldn't work. And so what we have been doing in our lab is we have been working with older adults with um, Alzheimer's um, which I know don't always have dysphagia, but, but sometimes do have dysphagia. And we are using very simple scales where we're not asking anything about perception and we're simply asking liking. And this is called a cued facial scale, which was developed for individuals with um, cognitive problems. And what you see is the first part of the test. It's an iterative test where you start with three faces and you ask the participant to indicate which face represents their liking of the sample that they're consuming. And so it, it could be a smiley face, which indicates liking. It could be a neutral face or it could be a face that, um, while it looks a little angry, is actually meant to be dislike. If they indicate dislike, you then give them three additional faces and you say, okay, which of these three faces from slightly dislike to very dislike represents your disliking? And, and they give you a score for that. If they say like, then you do the opposite and you give them three very smiley faces, increasing in degree of smile, and they indicate which face represents their liking. And so in this way, what we get is an understanding of liking using a scale that is quite simple. Researchers have used something quite similar to actually collect information from children on how much they like different products from a temporal perspective. So children were asked to consume a product um, more, take more than one bite of a product and on every bite tell how much they like the product. And what the researchers discovered is that children don't actually want to answer how much they like a product more than once. 
it's they either like it or they don't like it and it doesn't really change during chewing. So what they discovered was that it was better to ask how much they enjoyed the sample. And I think that there's probably some relevance in using this for an older adult population in order to measure temporality of enjoyment rather than temporality of liking. And so this is something that I'm hoping to be able to employ soon the next time I want to conduct some liking uh, tests on different samples that we have been working on. So in the last part of my talk, what I want to touch on is the role of oral processing and its impact on sensory perception. As I've alluded to throughout this talk, oral processing is going to be impacted by food properties and by oral physiology, and both food properties and oral physiology are going to be impacting sensory perception. And so ultimately, we need to understand what factors are contributing to the perceptions that um, people have when they consume food products. And, and we like we like to work with solid with semi-solid pureed food products and the reason why we like to work on them is because the process of pureeing takes away most of the the product matrix and leaves this semi-solid puree that doesn't require chewing or biting it just requires palating and because we're palating the sample we can remove any confounding effects that could be occurring during an oral processing study because of different dentition or different chewing rates and we can really focus on key key oral processing parameters. And in the case of a semi-solid puree, particularly one that has added um, starch to it, is what's happening with the saliva. And so what you see on this, on this slide is a picture of carrot puree that's been palated to the point of swallow. And so the left hand is the puree before it goes in the mouth. The middle is mid-oral processing and the the image on the right hand side is actually at 21 seconds just before the product is being swallowed. And we know that it takes about 21 seconds for a, an individual with um, a normal swallow to be able to orally process that puree to the point of swallow. And so, as I said, it's saliva that we're interested in looking at. And the reason why is because of the compounds that we find in saliva. So we know that saliva is 99% water. So we know that dilution of a product is going to occur when it's in our, in our mouth and we're orally processing. But there are many other things that we can find in saliva. And in our lab, we're interested in these two compounds, amylases and mucins. Alpha amylase is an enzyme that we know works on starches, and that's where we have focused much of our attention for the last few months. We're hoping to focus on mucin shortly. These are mucopolysaccharides that we think may be impacting some of the, the slipperiness that could be perceived in a food product. So just to give you a brief outline of what amylases are doing when they're interacting with starches, on this slide, what we have is a starch molecule. This is amylopectin. So the yellow um, dots are all glucose molecules that are joined together. And when amylase comes in contact with a, an amylopectin, what it does is it breaks it, it cleaves it. And we end up with products like maltose, which is basically two glucose units attached together we get maltotriose, which is three, and we get dextrins, which are our branches. And in the chemical test that we use to understand how amylase is acting, it's the maltose we're interested in because maltose is going to give us an indication of how much amylase activity has, has been occurring because that is the, the smallest molecule that you can have. So our hypothesis throughout this research has been that when you have a semi-solid matrix like a carrot, as you're orally processing, what we're going to see is a reduction in viscosity. And we have measured this using a trained sensory panel and a technique called progressive profiling. And we've also conducted instrumental testing on, on the products as they have been orally processed. And we measure how much amylase activity has occurred, uh, which is an indication of the starch hydrolysis using a chemical test called the PABA test. And we feel that for our products, we hypothesize for our products that starch hydrolysis will go up during oral processing. 
So what we have here are the results of our progressive profiling. So in this case, what we have done is we have trained our panel to measure the intensity of thickness as it is perceived at different points during oral processing. And so we've selected seven seconds, 14 seconds and 21 seconds. And this is a plot of the perceived thickness at each of those three time points for three products. We have a control product, a 0.4% starch product, and the 0.8% starch. So it will come as no surprise to any of you that as you orally process this product, the viscosity, the thickness decreases and that the thickness is actually highest for the high starch. And um, again, it decreases over time. And so that is exactly what we would have expected to see. And so we were heartened to see that from our panel. When we take a look at instrumental viscosity, what we did is we tested the products when there was no liquid added to the products and we were measuring the viscosity of these products, we also, also measured the products when water was added or when saliva was added. And what we did here was we, we made sure that the amount of water we added was a similar amount to the amount of water that would have been in the saliva. So essentially what we were looking for here was to see if our saliva had some enzyme activity happening to it and was it impacting the viscosity? And so what we see on this graph is that when there's no liquid added to the carrot purees, the control is blue, the starch is orange, and the starch point four is orange and the starch point eight is green. Those products have the highest viscosity. When you add the water and the saliva, there really aren't that there aren't many huge differences between these two samples. They are lower in viscosity than the no liquid sample. We do see a significant difference in viscosity at the high starch or the 0.8% starch. And that those are the only differences in viscosity we see between the water and the saliva samples. And so what we are concluding at this point is that yes, perceived viscosity decreases over time. Our instrumental viscosity shows that at 0.4%, there's no difference between the saliva and the water. And so therefore the reduction in viscosity that we um, see is due to dilution and not due to amylase activity. However, when we have that higher starch content of 0.8%, the instrumental viscosity is significantly lower when the product is mixed with saliva, and so therefore hydrolysis of starch is occurring. So we wanted to spend some time understanding that amylase activity, and the first thing we did is we measured the amylase activity of the saliva that we were working with, and so we had an individual chew the food products the control, the 0.4 and the 0.8% starch, and well, not chew, sorry, palate the food products. And then we had them spit the product out so that we could measure the amylase activity and compare it to fresh saliva. And we can see that there was amylase activity happening in the products, in all three of the products during, during the process, the oral process. When we take a look at the maltose that's being released, remember I told you that that's what we're measuring as an indication of amylase activity. What you can see here is that for all three products, the control being in blue, the 0.4 in orange and the 0.8 in green, that there is a slight increase in the maltose released from um, the time of the start of oral process through 21 seconds. However, you can see that for the 0.8 and the 0.4, it plateaus and almost decreases a little bit at that at the end of oral processing. And so what we're concluding at that point is that in all three cases, that continuous increase is, is happening because of, of the starch. In the case of the control that actually has no added starch, carrots still have starch in them naturally. And so we are seeing that that carrot starch is being digested in the control. The, decre the decrease from seven to 21 seconds in the starch added samples could be because the amylase is not acting with the starch anymore, but is act interacting with other food components. Foods are very complex to work with and carrots have compounds called flavonoids that we know interact with amylase. And we suspect that is what is um, interacting with the um, amylase later on in oral processing. And so with that, I just want to summarize briefly what all of this means so that you can 
synthesize all of this information. As, as I said to you earlier, we need to think about the food and we need to think about the person and the oral process that's happening. So from a food perspective, what we know is that different thickeners and different amounts of thickeners are going to alter our sensory properties and that this occurs during the entire period of oral processing. We also know that with individuals with swallowing difficulties, this is probably quite important information to know. In the work that we have conducted with individuals with dysphagia, when we conduct interviews with them to ask them what they think about the food that's being presented to them, often they will say that they use the look of the food to decide if they think it's safe to put in their mouth so that they're not going to aspirate it. And in the case of that xanthan added product, it could be that some individuals think that it looks too slippery for them to be able to safely consume. And indeed, there is a perception of slipperiness in that product. We know from a person perspective that oral processing is going to impact perception in the case of semi-solid matrices where we're really only focusing on saliva, that the saliva changes are due to that dilution effect because of the high amount of water that's in saliva, but also due to enzyme activity. We know that with um, other types of food products and um, even possibly with these semi-solid matrices that there are other aspects of oral processing that are also important. And so the work will continue. And with that, I will close and I will entertain any questions you may have. Thank you so much, uh, Lisa, for your presentation. Um, we will now move on to the Q&A uh, period. So if you're listening in and you have any questions, please submit them through the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom of your screen. Um, we want to be respectful of everyone's time, so we'll try to stay focused on relevant questions to today's topic. Um, so Lisa, I have a first question for you that came in, Josie Richer, I believe. Um, and they say, because of slipperiness of xanthan, would you think it should be used with patients with dysphagia, considering it might ease the swallowing or would it have a dangerous effect? Yeah, I think um, it's going to depend on the amount of xanthan that you're adding in. I, it will, at higher concentrations, become... Uh, too slippery to be safe to consume, but I I think at lower concentrations, you probably will be fine. But I I have not tested the safety of the swallow because that's not something that we focus on. We really only focus on the sensory perception. So I'm not sure at what point it would move from being um, okay and and good because it helps encourage swallow through to the point at where it's dangerous to swallow. Great, thank you. Um, Joanna Pollard is asking, is it the presence of families that thins out the hot cream of wheat following five to 10 milliliters of feeding a residence, this food item? You can hear the coughing that occurs in the dining area. Oh, well, that's interesting. So cream of wheat would, um, it might be. So I, I'd have to think a little bit more about that. Um, but it, yeah, it very well might be. Um, if you if you could email me that question, I can do some thinking about it just to um, spend a little bit more time with that because I know that there's a lot more going on than than um, amylase activity that could be contributing to that cough. So let me have a think about that and just send me an email. My email's on the screen. Yes, thank. You. I was just going to say that. Thank you, uh, Joanna, for submitting your question and anyone that is still listening. You can contact Lisa through that email that you see on your screen. Um, thanks, Joanna. Perfect. Uh, do we have any more questions? Uh, please, we, we still have some time. So um, please go ahead and submit your questions. Lisa, you and I can hang out for a bit if, if people are still typing in. That's your live. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, while we wait for other questions, I would like to uh, point out again that the webinar is being recorded and that it will be available on the IDDSI website at the end of the week. Uh, you will receive a certificate of attendance and, and if you're listening in through the phone, again, please email us at meetings at IDDSI.org to let us know who you are so that we can send it to you. Um, uh, as well, I wanted to say that if you're not 
already signed up for a monthly e-bytes, I highly recommend that you do that. We send them once a month. Uh, we do not spam you. <laughs> and we include the most relevant information that is happening around the world um, with, with, the, with IDDSI and implementation in different facilities. So if, if you're listening in, uh, it is likely that you've been, <laughs> um, that you already subscribed, but that is available for you. Um, Josie is asking, is this also for a pediatric diet? The, um, the modified texture foods? I think that's what sh I think that's what Josie means. But Josie, if you could clarify, maybe I can move on to another question, and then if Josie types in, we can answer that. Um, Rebecca is asking, what other foods did you test besides carrot puree? <laughs> um, yes, my students like to ask that too because I think they're getting tired of carrots. Um, <laughs> we have tested um, turkey. Um, we have also. We which, as I, uh, I would say, is a very complicated product, actually, to get a, a product that's smooth because you get a lot of um, very small particulate sandy matter if you're using a lot of um, dark meat in your, in your turkey, in your pureed turkey. We've also looked at some commercial bread, pureed breads, um, and we... Um, and that's pretty much it. We've really spent a lot of time focusing on carrots because the matrix, we know the matrix quite well. Um, but yes, turkey and um, bread would be the other we've looked at. Great, thank you. Uh, Zachary is asking, during the testing phase, did you notice the starch thickeners thickened more over time as opposed to the santan-based thickeners? Uh, um, we um, control for that. So. So I don't, I, I would assume they would, but we control for it during testing and always make sure that when we're testing, we test, we have prepared the samples the same amount of time before testing starts, but I would assume they would. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lauren is asking about an email address. Uh, so Lisa's email address is on the screen, but if you are wanting to um, email about the webinar, you can do that at meetings at iddsi.org. Again, if you're typing in, Lauren, I do not need you to email because we already have a registration for you. So don't worry about that. This is only for people that are calling in through a phone line. But thank you for, for asking. Uh, Josie did not get back to us. So I, I'm going to put that question on the side for now. Uh, Emily is asking, Lisa, with the control carrot puree, because there was some liquid le leakage, did it still meet the requirements for IDDSI puree level four? Um, yes. Great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Easy. Yeah. Uh, okay. I would, can I just make a comment about carrots though? Um, we have discovered uh, because we've spent so often studying carrots that not one carrot is created equally. So if you are pureeing your carrots and you um, are getting your carrots at different times of the year from different providers um, to, to do that puree, you're going to see significant differences in your carrots because in some cases, our carrots show a lot of cineresis depending on the variety. And I can't tell you those varieties because all I know is whether they were product of Canada or a product of Mexico. Um, so we've had to find a consistent carrot supplier in order to make sure that we have the best product that we can have. Great. Uh, Lisa, I think you and I talked about this uh, and I have a copy of the slides um, so you and I can decide later or you can decide if you want to make those available for the public and if they are, they will be available uh, on the IDGSI website on the resources page and since I am talking about that, um, that is uh, your go-to spot for everything IDGSI related. Uh, so if you have any questions about the framework or the levels or triangles, or audit sheets, or consumer handouts. Uh, that is a place where you can get the official IDDSI versions. There is a lot of material uh, going around uh, in the World Wide Web, but please refer to, to the resources page on our website because that page contains the most updated information and, and the resources that 
the IDDSI board has created. Uh, Wen is asking, have you trialed any of the shaped purees available commercially? Um, yes, in the example of descriptive analysis that I showed you with C1 to C4, one of them was shaped. And um, I believe it was the C1 that was shaped, actually. Okay, thank you. Uh, Juan, uh, Lisa's email is on your screen, so that is, I'm just going to spell it for folks that I can't uh, see the screen at the moment. So that would be L D U I Z or Z, depending on where you are, E R at U O G U E L P H dot C A. Um, and so, yes, Juan, you, you, you can submit. Uh, questions to Lisa to Lisa directly through that email. Um, if there's any more questions, now is the time to do it, folks. We have a few more minutes, uh, and okay, Josie, um, you didn't follow up with your pediatric diet question, so all I can say for now is that the IDDSI does have pediatric considerations, um, and. To find those, you can visit our website. We have a very handy resource that includes the whole framework for pediatrics, uh, and, and that's been really useful for folks. Um, someone is asking, how would you say perception of complex flavors, such as in Indian masala, with heavy spices change through a meal? Oh, that, that's a whole lecture. Um, so the, you, are, you have to start with um, how comfortable you are with spicy food. So if you're somebody who's fairly comfortable with spicy food, then there's going to be, um, there's, it's not going to be uncomfortable for you. You will see an increase in the heat as you consume the food um, because it, it will continue to build. It, it just keeps building on itself. Uh, if you're somebody who is uncomfortable with heat and somebody's forcing you to eat this thing you don't want to eat, you probably start with an intensity that is so screamingly high that you may, <laughs> it's, it's just going to keep building until it's incredibly uncomfortable and you just don't want to consume it anymore. I'm not sure if that quite answers the, the question, but it basically comes down to um, the burn, which is actually perceived w with what's called a trigeminal nerve. Right. Uh, the, the question was um, whether per perception of the flavors changed through the meal. Um, I, I mean, from what you're saying, it sounds to me like it would. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, Okay. And I think you. that eventually the heat is just going to override any of the flavors. Right. Okay. Daniel Lee is asking, so based on your findings, would you recommend prescribing a preferred thickener in patients with dysphagia? So um, is there a preferred thickener? Um, or would you I, recommend I, a preferred thickener that you would uh, recommend? Well, to so I, the, the nice thing about xanthan is you don't have to add much xanthan to get an effect. Um, but it, it does worry me a, a little bit about that slipperiness. Um, I think the cornstarch, you have to, from a nutrition perspective, you're offsetting more of your nutrition with cornstarch because you're ha adding a higher amount of cornstarch. But even having said that, it's not a huge amount of cornstarch. So I think either one would work. The xanthan does have a slight, the xanthan thickened carrots anyway, have a slightly different flavor than the, than the cornstarch thickened carrot. It's not bad. It's just slightly different um, because I, um, it tastes, a, it has a flavor that's maybe not quite as, uh, as strong, I, I would say, but I don't think people would notice that necessarily, if, that you would have to be a trained panelist to notice that. Great, there you go, Daniel. Okay. We'll give it again another minute or so to see if we, Oh, there we go, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca is asking, did you mix the santan and, and, and cornstarch with water? 
before adding to the carrots or the test foods, or did you add it directly to the food being tested? We, so we had a, quite a lengthy process. We pureed the carrots. And then what we did is we actually added the, the cornstarch because the cornstarch could be added without, with, without water. And in both cases, the cornstarch and the xanthan, we beat into the, the carrots. We didn't um, puree it in. We used a mixer to beat it in because we found that that gave a better distribution of the powder throughout the, the carrot puree. So it was a multi-stage process to, mm -hmm. to get the product into the, the carrots because we didn't want a lot of moisture in, in the pro added moisture in the product, which is why we added it dry. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Indian masala question. Um, we have a follow-up question sure. here asking, is there a certain desensitization that occurs with exposure to strong tastes throughout the meal? Um, whoever asked me that question, if you send me an email, I can send you a paper that, that will answer your question. <laughs> Great. Um, so there you go. This is for ASR, uh, SR, sorry. So if you um, want a bit more information on, on these questions, you can email Lisa directly and her email is on your screen. But thank you for submitting that question. Uh, Daniel is asking, how does having cornstarch offset the nutrition? Because it's, it's, um, so you have a carrot that is a pure carrot, and then whenever you add anything into it, you're you're diluting down your nutrients because you're you're providing a a different volume of product. Um, I, I'm not going to explain this very well. I'm using my hands, and nobody can see my hands. Um, so basically, if you think about carrot being 100% of a nutrient, if you're going to add cornstarch in and you are giving the same volume of carrot, you now have cornstarch and carrot. So you are diluting some of those nutrients. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank, I'm glad you understand, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> And then Anna is asking, what would you suggest for a blend of the xanthan and the starch? 80% and 20%, for example? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it, it depends on what you're looking for. So if you want something um, that is, uh, um, if, if you want to mask the graininess, then you would want um, more xanthan than less xanthan. So it really depends on what your ultimate goal actually is. And the graininess was not offensive. So it, it just was a, a, a bit grainy. Mm -hmm. Great. There you go, Anna. Um, how did you control for saliva? And, and how did you control for saliva? And during the oral process, how does it interact with different thickeners? Well, that's the question we're trying to solve. So right now I only know how saliva um, is is working with starch, but we also want to take a look at how saliva is interacting with the xanthan. Um, so I, I, right now I don't know the answer to that question, but hopefully within the next um, little while, I will know the answer to that question. Um, and the first part of that question was, how did I control for saliva? That's right. Yeah, so what we did is we used one person and that person was a healthy individual who refrained from eating um, anything um, that was possibly going to impact um, their salivary flow or their salivary composition. So they basically ate the same type of meal all of the time so we could control for their saliva. And we collected at the same time every day. And for a lot of the tests, what we did is we then added the saliva back in. So it was stimulated saliva where she chewed parafilm and then spit into a, a vial. And then we used a pipette to extract that back out to then do our testing. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions and then we're going to end the webinar. Joanna is asking, how does wheat flour as a thickener perform as compared to xanthan and starch? Um, what would it do? You would probably need to add more wheat flour than you would xanthan and starch. 
it's it's going to thicken. It, it will thicken. You will just need to add more um, because it will take more flour to to do the same thing as as the starch and the xanthan because the flour um, just has less starch in it than a, than the the corn starch. Great. Um, okay, uh, Jody, uh, you're interested in the in the exposure to strong tastes. Uh, please email Lisa directly. Again, her email is on the screen right now, and we'll share it uh, once we send uh, the copies of the certificates of attendance. Uh, so thank you for that, Joanna. We answered your question, and then we have our last question: Why would you not use a more natural product? such as instant potato flakes or tapioca pearls? Well, you could. You could, and in some of the earlier research we conducted, we were looking at um, adding skimlet powder. Um, we were adding infant um, formula that we knew was going to be thickening, and, and, and you could. There would be nothing wrong with doing that, and it would actually be a nice way to boost some of the nutrition, and, and that's why we were looking at that, because skim milk powder was going to improve the protein content. So, yeah, for sure you could. There's no reason not to. We were, in this case, we were looking at more fundamental research, and so that's why we didn't do it. Great. Uh, I'm going to sneak one more question. Uh, Ellen, is Hawk, uh, Ellen Hawk is asking, would you think would you think about extending your research to children with sensory feeding problems? Um, sure. I've studied children before, <laughs> and there's a lot of similarities between what um, I have done with testing with children and, and what I do with older adults. Great. Okay, fantastic. So with that, we are going to end the webinar. Again, a reminder that the recording will be available and that certificates will be coming to your email uh, within the next couple of days. If you know of anyone who would benefit from listening to this webinar or who would be interested in this topic, please uh, feel free to share the recording with them. Uh, thank you so much, Lisa, for your informative uh, presentation today and for uh, the other session that you did uh, two days ago. Um, obviously, we, we had a, a big turnout, which is exciting, and lots and lots of questions. So I hope you don't get bombarded with, with, with questions <laughs> in the webinar. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, your information when we send out those uh, certificates, as I said. Uh, and thank you uh, to all the listeners for joining us today. We hope that you found this information useful in your practice. Uh, we'll be signing off now. So have a great rest of your day, evening, or morning, and week. And until next time, so thank you very much. Thank you.